Today, as we are all aware, in celebration of the Lenten week, we are now at the Easter Sunday or the Resurrection Sunday celebrated by all the world. Uh, it also happened to be on an April Fool's Day. Well, you are probably all familiar with April Fool's Day. This is a celebration that are usually com commemorated by playing practical jokes or spreading hoaxes in order to catch victims. And the victims will, will then be called those who are April Fools because they are victim of those uh, pranks that had, be, had been conspired against them. Well, April Fools, uh, April Fools Day, although it is a bit or it is uh, gaining a popularity in the Philippines, is not as much celebrated as it is in the Western and European countries. It is a widespread celebration in the West that even published media such as newspapers and magazines and social media can report fake stories so that tomo uh, later on, probably later of the day or the next day, it shall be explained away as a hoax. Well, that is the April Fool's Day. This leads us to our topic for this afternoon. And we have been dealing about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ as we have it in the 15th chapter of uh, the first epistle of Paul to the Corinthians. And we may ask the question that if Christ's resurrection was indeed just a hoax, it is a lie, it is a conspiracy, that has been spread by fanatical followers of the Lord Jesus Christ in the first century, then can we say that Christians who are celebrating the Easter today, believing that Christ was in fact risen, or, not, or even not, on, uh, not today as an Easter, but, uh, but Sunday by Sunday for that matter, can they be called the biggest April Fools of all time? Because they had given themselves for a lie, for a conspiracy, for something that has no veracity. Well, this question is precisely where we are at in the Apostle Paul's first epistle to the Corinthian believers. And I want to remind you that we are studying this not because uh, of the Lenten Easter, but we are doing a series of sermons to, uh, from the epistle of Paul first epistle of Paul to the Corinthians. But since, uh, it is, uh, since Christ's resurrection is very much in the mind of the people today, then let us take our study this afternoon as something that is providential, that we can study God's word about the resur resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn with me again, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We have already read the uh, portion where we are going to base our uh, message this afternoon. But let me read again a portion from what we have already read. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 17 to 20. It says, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So this is the word of the Lord. We are proceeding on our, uh, on our study of the 15th chapter of this epistle, and we have already introduced this subject matter on our previous sermon last Sunday. And as I have said, this is the great New Testament passage that teaches uh, on the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead, both the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and our future resurrection as those who are united with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have learned that what occasion the writing of this epistle is that some from the church of Corinth are denying 
the reality of a future resurrection for believers. And we have that in verse 12. Some of them, Paul said, are saying there is no resurrection from the dead. And what the Apostle Paul did, as we have seen last Sunday in our previous section that we studied, Paul reminded them that the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is one of the fundamental articles of the gospel message. This is the gospel message which the Apostle Paul has received from the Lord himself, from his apostles, and this is the same gospel that he is, uh, he is uh, passing on to the Corinthian believers. And the message is that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and on the third day he rose. He, rise, uh, he rose from the dead. And uh, the Apostle Paul is saying that this is as basic as the gospel could get, that we have a risen Savior who has emptied the tomb and who has triumphed over the grave. Well, most likely that no one really inside the, Co the, the Corinthian church is denying that Christ rose from the dead. This is, as we have learned, a fundamental article of the, uh, of the Christian faith. So it is most likely that uh, no Christians inside the Corinthian church are actually denying that Christ really rose from the dead. But what they are denying is that believers shall share that same faith, that same future, that uh, believers too are going to be raised from the dead. But what the Apostle Paul is contending for in the passage that we have read is that the future resurrection of believers entails denial of Christ's resurrection as well. These two goes hand in hand because this, these two are a result of their union with one another. We shall be raised again in the future if we are united to Christ or not Christ, nor, uh, nor the, the believers shall be raised again. This too goes hand in hand. As the Apostle Paul said in this chapter, Christ is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Meaning he is the first fruits and more shall come in the future. And that is what the Apostle Paul is, uh, is contending here for. That you cannot die Deny the, the other without, uh, without uh, with it denying also the other side. And if you deny the resurrection of Christ and of believers, the Apostle Paul said, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised in verse 15. And it is something repeated in verse 16. And for the Apostle Paul, when the doctrine of resurrection is denied, both the resurrection of Christ and the resurrection of the believers, then Christian faith and proclamation becomes worthless. It becomes utterly worthless. It, it, it becomes something that has no value. The language of the Apostle Paul in verse 15 is that it becomes vain. It becomes futile. It will not be advantageous to anyone. And that is the message that I want to bring to you this afternoon, brethren. The worth of the Christian faith hangs on the reality of the resurrection. Ang katuturan ng pananampalatayang kristyano ay nakasalalay sa katotohanan ng muling pagkabuhay. The worth of the Christian faith hangs on the reality of the resurrection. If Christ was not resurrected, and if we do not have any hope of a future resurrection, then Christ and the Christian religion has no advantage whatsoever. And that means we should uh, be soon, should be leaving churches if Christ is not resurrected from the dead because Christianity then would become just a sham, just a delusion. Because as the Apostle Paul is going to show here in this chapter, 
is that there are two miseries that, that we are going to be left with if there is no resurrection of the dead. Two miseries we are left with if there is no resurrection from the dead. First, we remain lost in sin. And second, we are left without hope. We remain lost in sin. And second, we are left without hope. And those two things are uh, what the Apostle Paul is saying here. If Christ did not rise from the dead, and if we are not going to rise from the dead as well. Uh, let us look first uh, with the reality that we remain lost in sin apart from the resurrection of Christ. Look at what the Apostle Paul said in verse 17. He said, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Nandoon pa rin kayo sa inyong kasalanan. And what the Apostle Paul is saying here as a lesson for us is that the certainty of our salvation from sin relies on the reality of Christ's resurrection. Ang katiyakan na tayo ay merong kaligtasan ay nakasalalay sa katotohanan ng muling pagkabuhay ni Yesu Cristo. Now, it is right to affirm that cross that the cross takes a central place to the Christian faith. The cross is the main message of the Christian faith. We have here uh, if you remember earlier in uh, when the apostle Paul uh, talked about the philosophy of his ministry in chapter 2. He said in chapter 2 verse 2 that he decided to know nothing among the Corinthians except Christ and him crucified. That means the person of Christ and his work as uh, particularly focused on his redeeming work, on his substitutionary work on the cross of Calvary, wherein he offered atonement for the sake of sinners. So the cross is central to our faith, but we must remember to give due appreciation to the truth that the victory of the cross, the result of the cross in redemption is suspended. Until the resurrection. The cross awaits its outcome till the resurrection. And it is in this sense that the, that, that the empty tomb must be as much an emblem of the Christian religion as the cross. Because we should realize that if Christ was not risen from the dead, then that means... We remain unredeemed from the penalty of sin because that means that His sacrifice on the cross has not been accepted by God. It was rejected by God and it was not a perfect offering. And therefore, we are still, on the, we are still under the penalty of sin. And if Christ was not risen, then we remain unredeemed, not only uh, under the penalty of sin, but also from the power of sin. Because that means we are still dead to sin, with no resurrected power working within us in order to overcome the enslavement to sin. But brethren, the good news is that we know that Christ is risen. As we have learned last Sunday, we know that Christ is risen because of the testimony of the Scripture sealed within our hearts by the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit and confirmed by the, fact of, by the facts of history that we indeed serve a risen Christ, a risen Savior. And it is because of this that we can be assured that we are no longer, if we are believers, we are no longer under the penalty of sin. As Paul said in Romans 4 verse 5, He was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. The resurrection of Christ is as much significant to our justification as much as the cross of Christ. 
and grounded in here is our security if we are trusting in Christ for our justification. In Romans 8 verse 34, the Apostle Paul issued the rhetorical question, Who is to condemn? And he said, Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us, interceding on our behalf because He is, in fact, a risen Savior. So the resurrection is significant, uh, is significant uh, in the matter of our justification, but also in the resurrection of Christ rests the victory of our present sanctification, the power by which we battle against the enslaving power of sin, against the dominion of sin, is a power of the resurrected Savior. In Romans 6 verse 4, the Apostle Paul said also that we were buried with Him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too might walk in the newness of life. Because we share in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, then we have access to the resurrected power of the Lord Jesus Christ in order that we may be able to walk in the newness of life, in a life that is sanctified, that is guide, guided by uh, the, the Word of God for our holiness. So do you see what the Apostle Paul is saying here? If resurrection is false, if it's not true, then salvation is a delusion. And you are still under sin, under its penalty and power. But since it is true, brethren, we can embrace the assurance of our salvation if we are believers in Christ. Paano naman kung ikaw ay hindi pa mana ng palataya? E dapat alam mo na ang problema ng tao ay kasalanan. Ang problema ng tao ay ang kaparusahan ng kasalanan at ang kapangyarihan ng kasalanan na umaalipin sa buhay mo. Man's problem is the penalty and power of sin. E ang tanong sa iyo, nagtiwala ka na ba sa kanya na namatay para sa kasalanan at muling nabuhay para sa ating Ikaaaring ganap sa harapan ng Diyos. Christ is the one who died and was raised for salvation from sin. Have you already trusted Him for salvation? Have you already embraced Christ as your Savior and as your Lord? Sana habang naririnig mo ang panawagang ito, ay magkaroon ka ng kaparehong uh, katiyakan na mayroon ng mga mana ng palataya na kapag tumingin ka sa krus ni Jesus at sa kanyang muling pagkabuhay, ay nandoon ang kaligtasan at kapatawaran ng kasalanan. But for believers, the challenge of this is that we should recover the significance of Christ's resurrection to our personal walk in faith. We must recover its significance because many Christians have become so fixated on the cross, which is not a bad thing. In fact, it is a good thing that we are keeping the cross central to our Christian life, our Christian faith. But let us not forget and neglect its, uh, its necessary integral component, which is Christ did not remain dead. He emptied the tomb and He rose again for our justification. And this is important because there are many re recurring themes of the Christian life that can be enriched by a refreshed sight of a resurrected Christ. Probably you are, uh, you are thinking of your battle against sin, how sin is uh, in some ways still uh, having a strong influence on you. And you are looking for uh, encouragements on how you may defeat the enslaving power of sin. Well, you can look at the Christ who has been resurrected and see 
that the, the power by which God has raised Jesus from the dead, as Paul has said elsewhere, is the same power that is at work in you in order that you may walk in the newness of a sanctified life. So that you may refresh your soul with these sights. Your prayer may be enriched by an assurance that a living Christ that is on the right hand of the Father is interceding on your behalf forever and forever. And so you may come, you may come boldly in the presence of God knowing that you have an advocate before Him. It may improve your worship or your, your battle with assurance of salvation. I've read about this woman who struggled for years on assurance. Despite her repeated reminder of the cross, she kept reminding herself that Christ died for her sins, that Christ was nailed on the cross, that He was the substitute for sinners, and still she battled with... with uh, gaining assurance uh, of her salvation. Once, she attended a conference where she heard a prominent uh, theologian on the resurrection and she heard the statement that the resurrection was God's yes to the cross. That when God saw the cross, He was pleased with it and He was satisfied and His wrath has been propitiated and that's why he gave a yes on that sacrifice by raising Jesus from the dead. And it is a yes to forgiveness. It is a yes to salvation. And when she heard that, she said she understood for the first time the doctrine of the resurrection and she was liberated. Well, we will be greatly impoverished in our Christian life if we neglect the significance of the resurrection. So let us keep the view of a risen Savior in our sights. So that is the first thing. But second, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then that means we are left without hope. Walang pag-asa. That is what Paul said in verse 17 of this epistle, in the following verses, he said, If Christ has not been raised, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. perished. If in Christ, he said, we have hope only in this life, we are of all people most to be pitied. Kung ang pag-asa natin kay Jesus ay pang dito lang sa buhay na ito, at walang panghinaharap. Ang sabi ni Apostol Pablo, tayo ang pinakakaawa-awa sa lahat ng mga tao. And I believe that Paul has in mind here the reality of suffering in the Christian life. We know the reality of suffering in the Christian life. And we are left miserable having suffered if we are serving a worthless cause. Kung ating, ang ating pinaglilingkuran ay isang patay na mesaya, eh, walang kabuluhan ng lahat ng ating pagpapagal at paghihirap para sa kanyang, uh, para sa patay na Panginoon. And the, the lesson here is that only a hope of future resurrection rewards Christian suffering. Tanging yung pag-asa lang ng buhay sa hinaharap, sa muling pagkabuhay, ang maaring magantimpala sa mga kapighatian na nararanasan bilang mana ng palataya. Apart from such hope, the Apostle Paul sees his apostolic labors as meaningless. He said, if Christ has not been raised, why are we in danger every hour? I die every day. I am exposing myself in great dangers such as fighting beasts in Ephesus. And if there is no hope of a future resurrected life, 
then all of these are meaningless. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying here. All of his sufferings for the cause of Christ is worthless, is meaningless without a hope of a future resur resurrection. Because without a hope beyond death, brethren, the sensible way of life is hedonism. And that is what Paul said here. If there's no resurrection from the dead, then let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Why would you expose yourself to persecution for the cause of Christ? Why would you deny yourself of earthly pleasures if there is no resurrection from the dead, if there is no hope beyond death? If there is no resurrection, then all of our sacrifices for the sake of Christ is simply the highest of folly, the highest of foolishness, and we are in fact the greatest April fools in all history. We, are, we should reject the idea of some Christians that say, well, it doesn't matter whether Christianity is true or not. What matters is that you feel good about it. You feel good about yourself being a Christian. Doesn't matter whether Christianity is true or not. It, have, it has therapeutic benefits anyway. It doesn't matter if Christianity is true or not. You have friends in the church. Well, that is not the case for the Apostle Paul. Paul said, if it is not true, if Christianity is not true, there are no secondary benefits. We are just of all men most pitiable because we have a false hope that would not reward us. You know that in the New Testament, suffering is presented as a reality of the Christian life. This is basic discipleship for the Apostle Paul. In Acts 14 verse 22, when he went uh, to the church in Antioch, he said to them, through many tribulations, we, we must enter the kingdom of God. Well, contrast this to uh, what, people are, uh, what people are saying about the Christian life, that the, the substance of the Christian life is health, wealth, and prosperity. And, certain, and not so in the mind of the Apostle Paul. He said also, in 2 Timothy 3 verse 12, All who desire to live a godly life in Christ will suffer persecution. And if resurrection is a false hope, then all those sufferings that we have experienced for the sake of Christ are meaningless. But brethren, since resurrection is certain, then none more worthy cause to suffer and die. We know that Christ is risen and so shall we. That's why we possess a certain assurance that everything we suffered for the Christian life will soon be compensated in glory that we are going to share with the Lord Jesus Christ. Every loss, every pain for, for the sake of Christ Every persecution you are receiving from your family and friends because you are professing Christ. Every rejection, every sleepless nights and tiring day you have suffered for the cause of Christ. Every tear shed, all shall be rewarded because there is a hope of a future resurrection. That is why Paul said in Romans 8 verse 18, 18 that he considers the sufferings of this present time as not worth comparing with the glory that we shall receive, that, that is going to be revealed to us in the revealing of the sons of God. And for this reason, we see in the New Testament that the second coming of Christ is presented to us as our blessed hope. It is where we put our focus on in order to persevere and to continue to endure sufferings and persecutions.
because we are serving a victorious cause. There is an interesting character in uh, the Greek mythology, and the man is uh, Sisyphus. Sisyphus was, a, was an avaricious king, and he was a proud king, and because of that, he was punished by Zeus to roll a, a huge stone, a boulder, up a hill. And he pushed on and rolled the stone upward and upward and upward only for it to roll down before reaching the very top. And that means the other day, he shall again be pushing the stone uphill and then it shall, uh, it shall be something that will be repeating over and over and over again. That is vain work. That is a work, that is a labor that does not have a promise of victory. But are we, as Christians, serving a defeated cause? The answer is no. We are serving a victorious cause, and therefore all our labors shall not be in vain. That is why the challenge of the Apostle Paul here, in the last verse of this chapter, and that is the same challenge, that I want, to, uh, I want to offer to you this afternoon. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Our labor for the Lord is not in vain. And I'm speaking to those of you who are probably already weary of the work. Probably it is caused by discouragements. You are thinking that my service is not appreciated by the people. You may be thinking that I am serving Christ and trials seem to multiply. And you are seeing seeming defeats of the cause of Christ and, and the promise of victory seems to be Far off. Well, the challenge for you is to refresh to your sight the glory that you shall share when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. You should know, brother, sister, that your labor is for a victorious cause. And therefore, it is meaningful whether or not you are appreciated, whether or not trials are multiplying, or whether or not you are not seeing immediate victories, the assurance is that you are serving a victorious Christ and therefore your labor is never meaningless. You should know that the enemies of the kingdom of Christ shall be made his footstool. We have it in our text. Wrongful thrones shall be leveled and scepters shivered. We shall rise and share the glory of our Savior. That means on then, Christian soldier, on to victory. That is our path because none is a more worthy cause than the cause of Christ. And I speak encouragement to those who persist in fulfilling their work for Christ. And the challenge by the Apostle Paul is to abound, abound even more. Have a rock-solid constancy in the work of the Lord, anchored in the certainty of a hope of a resurrected life. During the middle of the second century, many Christians were martyred under the rule, the reign of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius. And one of the uh, most inspiring stories was the story of a woman by the name of Blandina. Blandina was a young slave uh, who professed Christ, and she had a frail body. And she was exposed as a Christian, and that means she, with, uh, among, uh, with, among with her brothers and sisters in Christ, shall receive uh, persecution and torture because they are uh, 
simply because they are Christians and followers of Christ. And because Blandina had a frail body, many of uh, her brethren during that time thought that she would not endure torture because she had a frail body and, it, and she would easily give in to torture and would deny Christ uh, easily. But to the shock of his uh, of her brethren and to the shock of her torturers, she endured with repeated statements that I am a Christian and I have done nothing wrong. And she endured up to the point that she already frustrated her torturers. They do not know what else they could do to her in order to harm her in that in to the effect that she would deny the savior she was uh, she was put into the amphitheater to be uh, to be uh, to, to be harmed by wild beasts in that amphitheater but she never denied christ and so she died never uh, never denying the lord jesus christ and after a few days, she was not buried. She was burned among other Christians who were martyred during the time. And the reason why they were burned is in order to mock the resurrection. They were burned in order to make the statement that these bodies shall not experience a resurrection from the dead. Well, if there is no resurrection, then their sufferings are meaningless. And our sufferings are meaningless. But because there is a resurrection, then there is a vindication for Blandina. There is vindication for all the martyrs in history and for all Christians who suffered persecution and all kinds of, of harsh words received, etc., there shall be vindication because Christ is risen and we shall share His resurrected life. So brethren, what kind of suffering are you going through these days? Well, put it in the perspective of a resurrection hope. So Christ's resurrection and ours is of great significance in the Christian faith. That is the point. Of this passage that is why we cannot settle for just a yearly celebration of the resurrection such as what is celebrated today but by the world as Easter celebration every Sunday we remind ourselves that it is the Lord's Day and we remind ourselves that we are serving and worshiping a risen Savior and we remember Him risen, and we with Him shall be. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious God, we thank You that You have given Your Son to us in order that He might die for our sins. But not only that, You raised Him from the dead for our justification. And so we come to you and pray that you would help us to gain more and more appreciation of the fact that we have a risen Savior who triumphed over, the dead, over death and help us to put all our sufferings in the perspective of, of a future hope of a resurrected life. And we pray that you would encourage us Encourage those who are weary. Encourage those who are persisting in laboring in the work of the Lord. And show us that we indeed are serving a victorious cause. And we pray, and we pray for those who are not with us in this cause. In do, those who do not have a hope of a resurrected life that is in, a, in an eternal blessedness. We pray that you would call them too, in order that they may be with us, sharing the blessed hope. 
of the coming of our risen Savior. So we commit these things to you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.